Okay, so uh, excuse me. Uh, Britt's out of town this week, so that means I'm up here. That's, uh, so we're in First John when I'm up here. Uh, so be praying for Britt. I think him and Leah are coming back Friday evening. Uh, so pray that they're uh, getting re-energized and uh, make it back safely. Um, so um, tonight, I, like I said, we're going to be in First John chapter 2. I'll be covering 26 and 29 of 2. And as I was printing my notes off uh, this morning, it occurred to me, so before I get started, I'm going to start. We always point out how uh, critical it is to have context on the Scripture uh, as you're trying to understand it. And it it occurred to me that Britt, on, on Sunday mornings, has been teaching from Galatians. And saying you don't have you don't do anything you don't have to do anything can't do anything to get saved. And John uh, in First John here, he is uh, often saying you got to be righteous, you got to purify yourself. So uh, if you don't have the context, you could think that they're contradicting one another. But the fact is, Paul in Gal- was writing to the Galatians where the false teachers. We're saying you had to do something. In 1 John, the false teachers that he's addressing are saying it don't matter what you do. Once you you reach that certain point of enlightenment, and we're going to get more into that in a minute as we do the context, it doesn't matter what you do. So that's the difference. They're they're addressing two different types of heresy. Uh, And so it's critical. I I wanted to point out uh, once again how critical context is. So when you're trying to study uh, scripture or when someone's preaching or teaching as you're evaluating their teaching, it's critical that you have context. Every passage that's, that you're looking at has to be in context. First of the entire scripture, it's all God's word. It has to all fit together. Second, who they're writing to, uh, when were they writing it, and what was going on that caused them to write the, the uh the, the scripture, and then ultimately, uh, like we're going to do tonight, you've got to uh, know exactly what they're talking about in that uh, part of the uh, of the uh, of the letter, where where they're going and what they're dealing with specifically right at that moment. So I, that, uh, that for that reason, I'm going to read all the way back to chap- uh, verse 15 of uh, chapter two uh, through 29. So, uh, thank you, yeah, thank you, Robin. Um, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. <clears throat> so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. <clears throat> but they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been appointed, anointed sorry, by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, 
just as it has taught you, abide in him. So, <clears throat> since it's been so long and, and some people weren't here the last time I was in 1 John, I think it's important to keep in mind, as I said, the context and the purpose of John's letter uh, to these churches, uh, uh, most likely the churches that uh, uh, are in Revelation. Uh, he he uh, had influence with those churches, and so that's who he's writing to here as well. Um, John wants us to be sure, uh, his, the reason he wrote the letter, he wants his readers to be assured of their faith uh, because as we see here, many were leaving the fellowship then. And so John starts his letter out uh, back in chapter 1, encouraging, <clears throat> excuse me, encouraging fellowship with God, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, and to encourage righteous living and love for the brethren. Uh, all so they can know that they are true believers and recognize uh, those who are not uh, true believers. And so that's the reason uh, he wrote the letter, but he also emphasizes the importance of, the, of following the apostles' doctrine. Uh, and and uh, the one more big reason John wrote this letter is uh, to refute the burgeoning heresy that is Gnosticism, uh, or known as Gnosticism. It wasn't fully blown yet, but it was beginning, and so... I believe that he's addressing that, and if you've been, if you go through it, you'll see so many things that they taught uh, as a direct, he directly deals with. Um, and uh, so John st uh, points out, he stresses the fact that Jesus is God, that, he, that God that took on flesh, and that with faith, without faith, try it again, <laughs> <clears throat> and that faith without a change in your life is not really faith. <clears throat> so Gnostics taught that false teaching, uh, their false teaching was that Jesus could not be the son of a God and born of a virgin, um, and that he either appeared to be a human or was a spirit uh, that, uh, that possessed the body uh, temporarily, and since spirit and flesh can't, Co-mingle, it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh. And that was their false teaching. Uh, so which, uh, that gets us to the immediate context of today's study. Starting in uh, verse 15, John says, Don't love the world. The lust for the things of the world and the pride of the things in this life are not from the Father. And in fact, all that's in this world is passing away. Um, in contrast to desiring... Uh, to live according to God's word, um, which has an eternal promise. The Gnostics taught uh, the opposite of that, that it doesn't matter how you live in this life if you reach a certain point of spiritual enlightenment because spirit and flesh have nothing to do with one another. Uh, then John, uh, we saw there, um, it, it's interesting that we're going through in Revelation in the 930 hour, so I suggest all of you be there for that, but John says, it is the last hour, and you have heard Antichrist, singular, but notice no the there, uh, is coming even now. <clears throat> and Antichrists, plural, are here, so you know that it is the last hour. Uh, to me, more than any other passage, this one is clear that the last days began at Jesus Christ's, I think, ascension back to the right hand of the Father and sending of the Holy Spirit um, and <clears throat> ends the day he returns and takes his people, the living and the dead, with him and finally judges all evil. Um, he answers plainly, who are antichrists? It's anyone that says Jesus is not the Son. Uh, the Gnostics taught Jesus could not be God, so John uh, moves on and says, those people are leaving the church because they never were part of the church. They never were believers. But the true believer has confidence through enduring faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only Lord and Savior of their life. So Jesus himself had promised eternal life to those who believe that. So then that gets us finally uh, to verse 26. <clears throat> I write these things to you about those who are trying to to deceive you. So 
here in uh, John kind of wraps up his warning of the Antichrist while at the same time encouraging the believers that they can be confident they are truly children of the living God. If the things of God and His kingdom are more important than the things of this world and that they believe Jesus is the Christ sent from the Father and they abide and live in that truth, uh, he says, I write to you who are enjoying the life with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because you are the ones that people want to prove wrong. So the, the false teachers, not necessarily false teachers, people that are holding on to that are, uh, are uh, also uh, trying to convince. And so what, uh, he, uh, why do they want to prove you wrong? Well, it's because of human nature and pride. Uh, if you have the truth, then guess what that means? They're, they're wrong. And nobody likes to be wrong. So he says, I write about those people who are trying to deceive you uh, or lead you astray. Or actually, I like there's some translations that say they're trying to seduce you. And uh, the actual Greek word there uh, means to cause to wonder or cause to roam. And so uh, everyone that holds to... Uh, uh, th uh, this heresy or any heresy is a false teacher that is intentionally trying to lead you away from Christ. Uh, but it's not, like I said a minute ago, it's not just those who have the position of teacher. Uh, many have their own God uh, the way they want to believe in or the one they want to believe in. So pride, again, requires to see God the way they do, others to see the God the way they do. That... Uh, that's, that's why one of my biggest pet peeves is when people say, uh, my God's not like that, or I don't think God would do whatever. I, it just drives me nuts. I usually, I'll usually stop them right in the middle and just say, respond with, uh, you have to look to Scripture to know what He's like and what He would or wouldn't do. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> So don't ever say, <laughs> tell anybody not to say, uh, I don't think God would be like that, because uh, I don't like it. <laughs> also, a lot of times people, uh, they just don't know scripture. They, they heard some of it, they get enough, just enough to be dangerous. Uh, you hear that about a lot of things, uh, especially electricity. <laughs> I've worked with electricity, or used to. Uh, yeah, you got, it can be dangerous. Same thing with the word of God, if you just know a little need to not try to tell other people about it. Um, and so um, that's why it says not everyone should teach. Uh, 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 just because someone thinks they know and they want to teach, uh, James 3.1, I don't know if it's up there, but uh, James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And uh, if you were in a prayer time tonight, you know we were requesting prayer for Chris and Britt and myself and Rodney as we try to teach because it's a, it's a serious thing to make sure we're dividing the, rod, the Word of God uh, rightly. And we, we put a lot of effort into it. And anyone that don't, sh that's not willing to do that shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be teaching. So John point, uh, the main point he, though is is you true believers, God's elect, may be staggered and waver, but can't finally be deceived by crafty, deceitful handling of the word because that can be overcome uh, by the Holy Spirit through prayer, <coughs> diligent study, and reading of the word. And that's why we all, all of us that ever teach here say you need to be questioning everyone that's teaching you or, or uh speaking of the Word of God, including us. I hope my prayer is that y'all go home tonight or if you don't have time tonight, if it's bedtime, I won't go that long, I promise. <laughs> that, uh, that you'll look through this and see that if uh, it's lined up with the Word. I mean, I try to use Scripture to make sure that I'm doing that, but, uh, but always question what you're hearing. And, and like I said, context, context, context. The three main things that, that, that all has to fit together. It's the Word of God, and there's, there's no errors there. He's, he's not one of us that wrote it. it God's perfect in every single way. So, uh, <clears throat> so my, uh, 
and John, like I said, finally, uh, he finishes off his point that the Antichrists uh, in his time were Gnostics, might be known, shunned and avoided. Uh, any false teacher that's not teaching the, true, the truth of the Word of God uh, needs to be uh, called out and, and avoided and shunned. So uh, John, like Paul and Peter, says that's not only not being mean, but it's necessary. Uh, so uh, in, in verse 27, uh, John says, But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, <clears throat> but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. So John uh, returns, he gets back now full on to encouraging uh, his uh, beloved brothers and sisters um, that, the, uh, that they have been anointed with the truth. What they heard from the beginning uh, was the truth, and the gospel doesn't change just because time goes by. So they don't need to be retaught the gospel, which is what the Gnostics were trying to do to these people uh, that John was writing the letter to. So in the, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the anointing, they anointed with oil, but it was a physical sign, of, out, of uh, an outward sign of inward, transforming forming and empowering work of the Holy Spirit, just like today. We just don't anoint with oil normally. Um, John reminds us of Jesus' promise that his physical presence was leaving so he could send the transforming, empowering, omnipresent Holy Spirit to every believer. Every believer that is a true believer of Christ has the Holy Spirit helping them to understand uh, these things when we study and when we hear people uh, teach and preach. Um, so because the third person of the Trinity is always with every believer, they have no need of any person to redefine or re-explain or elaborate or change uh, or add to the gospel. Uh, the Spirit that... Uh, revealed the word to them and, and brought them to uh, saving faith uh, also keeps that truth in their heart. And so uh, when uh, John, obviously John uh, here, it says you don't need anybody to teach you. Obviously he didn't uh, mean here that you don't need to be taught. Uh, we all do. I love to sit in Chris and Britt's teaching and other people actually as well. So uh, um, but he, he didn't mean that we don't need to be taught uh, because actually this letter is a teaching letter. Uh, he's teaching them what a true believer is and what a false uh, believer is. Uh, so not only that, but he continues saying that the, the anointing of the Spirit constantly teaches you about being a Christian uh, through an ever-increasing hunger. That's where our hunger to know what the Bible says comes from is the Holy Spirit and uh, for the truth of the word and for a thirst for righteousness, uh, our desire to be righteous, although we can't achieve it and our only real righteousness is found in Christ, he gives us the desire to be righteous. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's why he indwells us. So no one ever has perfect knowledge, uh, but all, all believers ought to be growing and learning throughout their life uh, until the day you die. Uh, uh, you need to be growing and learning and seeking to know Christ better and know, uh, know uh, who God is and how to live for him every day of your life. To grow and grow and grow. <clears throat> but uh, they do need the instruction. We do need instruction of Christ's faithful servants. Uh, remember, uh, we looked at James 3, but also remember what it says in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11. Uh, Right on time. Thank you. <laughs> and he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. And verse 12 says, For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. <clears throat> but again, as, as I said, the teaching's not for everyone. It has to, uh, there's a calling to it. And uh, it does. Uh, only those who are called to teach who diligently search the scriptures for the truth and do not blend it with their own wisdom or the wisdom of man 
or from outside of Scripture revelation. Uh, those are all lies, and they're not the truth. If it's not straight from the Word, if it's something else, it, it's, uh, as, uh, it's, it's false teaching. So <clears throat> the thing is, <laughs> teachers don't necessarily have to be great orators or even really smart. I mean, uh, but it, they must take seriously the dividing of the Word of God. So as, as though, the, as it said in Ephesians there, they'll be greatly judged. Uh, because that's true, and that Britt said it, Chris said it, and I say it again, and I've said it before too as well. Uh, it's a fearful thing to teach the Word of God. It's uh, because uh, it's uh, it is God. Uh, that's one thing we got to remember: the holiness of God is so far above us that uh, everything we do, and especially teaching of His Word, uh, is is uh, serious business. So. Um, <clears throat> The uh, Christ uh, uh, gave every one of us when he called you to make Jesus Christ your hope and trust. And so verse 27 here says, Keep everything in life, what you hear and do, centered in Christ and co controlled by your love for him. So then in verse 28, <clears throat> it says, And now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. So it says, and now, uh, in other words, to sum up really this whole thought that he's been uh, uh, building up since uh, verse 15, on, uh, and says, listen to me, my precious ones. Uh, the, uh, uh, or I, we've said before when it, she says little children here, the word is, more like my, the darling, so it's a loving, affectionate term that he's uh, uh, using. And it says, uh, remember back at the beginning of his letter, he said, I desire for you, uh, for your fellowship to make my joy complete. So he, he, to the believers, we encourage one another just by being together. That's why it says we should not forsake the gathering together because we need each other. It may not be you... I've heard people say that I don't, you know, I don't need to do that. I can read the word and I listen to it. But uh, if you're, that's first place, that's selfish. And second, uh, we need you. And if you can't, if you can be here, you need to be here. Uh, and, and gathering together to encourage one another and build each other up. Um, but he says, uh, I'm writing this letter so you won't sin. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father. <coughs> So he says here, remain in him. Or in other translations, continue in him. Or the, the SV here says abide in him. So uh, again, the Greek, the Greek word here is to stay with him. Um, and I think of uh, that, that's what he's saying right here, to stay right where you are. Don't drift. Don't be swayed or, or pulled away by false teaching. Uh, but uh, remember the true gospel. There is but one gospel. And so 1 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 6 it says, Love the world and money, uh, early in the chapter, lo the, the love of the world and money leads to grief. But then Paul defines what he means to abide in Christ, uh, I think, pretty well, uh, and how to practice righteousness. In verse 11 it says, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So if we're living uh, for Christ and have him at the core of all we do, if we desire the righteousness of Christ to dwell in us, and if we l desire to live a godly life according to his word, not according uh, like the Gnostics taught or whatever, or like in uh, Galatians, uh, if you do that, then that's right. That's not it. If we look according to God's word, what he says uh, do, <clears throat> then uh, and our faith is in Christ alone, uh, if we love God more than anything and love all people and do 
that no matter what and are gentle to each other and with those we have opportunity to share the gospel, we do, uh, all to advance the kingdom of God and for his glory, uh, and then uh, that's assurance. When that's what we're about and that's what we want to do, uh, not, not that we have to do it perfectly, but that's an assurance that we are true believers of, of, uh, of the Lord. So we can be a confident that our eternity with Christ is our destination. And that's the point of John's, uh, really, from 15 to 29. So that his, the true believers there at those churches would know that their destination is with eternity with Christ. So, uh, and that's, uh, it, we'll see next week, and actually 28 and 29 are kind of tied with 3, 1 through 3. Uh, and we'll see more of that uh, Next week is one of those places where the chapter break, while it's good for us to find things, is kind of unfortunate a little bit. Because, but anyway, uh, so uh, that's uh, we'll see that there's that's an uh, the first aspect of the hope of the promise of eternal eternal life is if we uh, see if that's the goal of our life is to glorify God, uh, and that's how everything we do is centered around that. So. Uh, and once again, that's not what gets us there. Uh, uh, Christ secured our destiny uh, on the cross, and the Holy Spirit sealed it when he called us. Uh, uh, and so the, the, but the command to abide is not passive. We can't just sit back and wait. Because Paul also wrote, uh, uh, the one who wrote Galatians, that said you don't have to do anything, also wrote Philippians 2, um, Verses 12 through 15. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or arguments, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding firmly to the word of life. That's the first part of verse 16 I added on there. So we have work to do. Uh, we do it for God's glory, but in the doing we have assurance. Uh, our assurance is in the fact that we want to do what God says in his word. Um, there's no bonus points but we have pleasure and confidence in being used for the glory of God. Um, unlike those who have a form of godliness uh, but deny its power, who deny Christ, uh, or who do not know Christ at all. And so I, I, at the end of verse 28 here, I just we need to ask ourselves the question, does it make us sad, uh, the people we know who deny Christ or, or don't know him at all? Does that really uh, break our hearts? Do we have a heart for them, uh, regardless of their who they are or what they do? Uh, we ought to be brokenhearted over their condition because they don't have eternal life. And if you don't have eternal life with Christ, that means you have eternal life without him and eternal judgment. So it ought to break our hearts if we're a believer. And that is another uh, assurance if it breaks your heart. So verse 29 and yeah, I'll wrap it up pretty quick here. So, uh, oh, I can't see. There it is. <laughs> if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So John says, if you know Jesus, that he's, he is eternally God and righteous in his nature and works, <clears throat> and as a man lived a perfect life, obedient even to death on the cross, and rose in power, then imputed his righteousness to you, if that is what your faith is built on, then you can be confident. Um, that's the second aspect of the hope of Christ uh, returning and everlasting life with him. It's not only does that hope sustain your faith, but it gives you a desire for righteousness. If you have a desire for God's righteousness, so John says, know that everyone who practices righteousness is 
is righteous. So not those who merely do righteous things. Uh, so we can confuse that as well, um, especially if we do righteous things to justify ourselves uh, or if we do it to exalt ourselves. Uh, that's not what uh, he's talking about here. Uh, we can't do anything to gain God's favor, but we can, we can seek to be righteous uh, because of his favor. So, uh, so that's not who John's talking to here in verse 29. He's talking to the true believers, uh, and in fact, those who uh, justify themselves are, are actually in, in opposition to God's gospel. Uh, the one who wants to establish his own righteousness actually shows ignorance of the gospel and has need of his grace. Um, who John is speaking to, however, is the ones who only believe the scripture and only have faith in Jesus Christ and know it is not um, what they do, but only by the grace of God for his own glory that they have any righteousness. The ones who perform and do good works in faith and from a principle of love, <clears throat> not to be justified, but that it is what they want to do because they are justified by the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. That is how you know you have been born again, adopted into the royal family of the eternal God. So, uh, uh, like I said, next time, uh, it's just be about three or four weeks, uh, we'll look back into 28 and 9 and add them with to... Uh, how they fit together with verses 1 through 3 and 5. But uh, that's uh, any questions or...